And we thank you, Father, for your tremendous ability to take care of us. Even when we think we're taking care of ourselves, <laughs> the truth is, if you ain't got us, we ain't got. Bless this time together, Father, as this message as we, it's June 18, 2017. We were blessed to see this day, Lord. Let us rejoice, the Bible says. This is the day the Lord has made. Come on, somebody, let us rejoice in it. And let the church say amen, amen. and amen. I want to be honest then. Let's get the, out, out the way. Mother's Day is overhyped. Amen. amen. I'm just going to say it like it is. Amen. Everybody got a mama. Everybody got a daddy too. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Mother's Day, this whole glowing, oh, oh, mom, dear mom, you know, you know, what a wonderful mom, the 16 things I love about mom, amen. All Mother's Day, the whole day, father get a dinner, all right, then holla, see y'all, we fed you, amen. All day, mom, the phone blowing up, Folk, folks who aren't even your children call you, I want to call you, take you happy Mother's Day. Really? Right. Father can't get a call from their own children. The other folk calling, other folk mama to wish them happy Mother's Day. We're going to flip the script today. Amen. I want to honor the men who were in this room by all accounts. They are not perfect fathers. Hallelujah. But nevertheless, they are fathers. Leadership, instruction, discipline, and love. These are the four roles that God has ordained that the Father should play. So the in leadership, instruction, discipline, and love. So how do the men of Crossroads Church stack up? Let's take a look at leadership. Let's talk about leadership at the house. There are fathers. Look at here. I want to show you something. There are several fathers here who are here with their wives. and They didn't send their wives and children. They came to church with their wives and children. They brought their children to church. They fussed about getting ready this morning. Somebody say amen. amen. What better example of leadership can you have than that? Look at the leadership we have at Crossroads Church. We're not a, we're in, a many, in, a, in, a, in a traditional sense, we don't have a lot of traditional offices because we, the Lord just hasn't ordained that period for us. But what we do have is men who are leading our starting point discipleship classes and what we do have are men who are leading our youth ministry and what we do have is men who are leading our audio and uh, visual ministry. What we do have is men who are leading our music ministry. What we do have is men who are leading our security team. That's all right. What we do have is men who are leading our finance. Our treasurer has been with us six or seven years. Amen. That's what we do have. Look at the number of children at this church. Amen, somebody. Just in case you didn't remember, take two folk. Mama, mama, mama did the hard and heavy lifting. Amen. I ain't gonna hate on that. Because if a brother was pregnant, it would be one month pregnancy. Amen. We're gonna find a way. Amen. Not much. No, no, no. Not gonna happen. We've got children in this church. Adult children who live with their parents and who found, watch this, and still love the Lord. Hey, I wish you would get that this morning. Come on. They're old enough to respond, and they still respond by coming to sit next to their fathers. I wish somebody would get that. Yeah, mama and the Bible teacher had something to do with that, but they saw their daddy come to church. Let's talk about love, and I'm going to jump into our text. I see all kinds of manifestations of love from the men at Crossroads Church. Most of y'all live in a comfortable home with a little plenty of food and a change of clothes. I wish I had a witness because your father gets up, he physically provides and financially provides. That's what we have at Crossroads Church. Men who got a job and men who go to work. Come on, somebody, amen. Matter of fact, some of them can't be here on Sunday because they, they having to work. That's what we got at Crossroads Church, amen. See, fathers don't get enough press. So then... If you are a father and you are 
in this building this morning, I want you to stand up. All the fathers in the room, please stand up. Give the Lord some praise for these men. Amen. All around the room. I want to show you something. Stay standing, men. I want to show you something. Look at the number of men in this room as it's compared to everybody else. You ought to get it. I'm telling you, you don't get it. I've been in so many instances in churches. I'm going to brag on y'all, brethren. Y'all ain't perfect. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. With a real perfect one, raise his hand so lightning can strike him. Amen. Who is he? I didn't see anybody volunteer. These men are not perfect, but they are fathers, amen, and they are in the house of the Lord, and they are receiving instruction under the, come on somebody, and they almost outnumber the women in the room this morning. You may be seated. So I don't want us to get another one of those let's beat up on our daddy messages because every Pastor Sean's good at preaching it. Mama, mama gets the 10 things I like about mama and daddy get, oh, well. Hey. <laughs> you know, he, you know he, he's my daddy, amen. So here's what I want to do in the, in the time we have left together. I, I got to do this. My daddy's name, <laughs> my, my daddy's name, if I hit this again, I'm going to punch in the face, amen. My daddy's name was Willie Joe Boone Jr. That's the country as it gets, amen. I'm sorry, I'm, I made a mistake. His name was Willie Joe Boone, and he wanted me to be Willie Joe Boone Jr., amen. And I would have wore that thing proudly, Kevin, I would have been Willie, I would have been William James Boone II, amen, but Willie Joe Boone Jr. By all accounts, and I'm going to be honest here, and if he was standing here, he would say amen. I remember the very first worship service we had over at Oakley Elementary School. And this is my first time preaching as a pastor ever in my life. And we had spent the year or so getting ready to birth the church. And my daddy's not a church man. He doesn't do church. Matter of fact, he told me when I told him, I'm going to quit my job, daddy, and I'm going to start a church. He said, you're going to quit your job? I said, yep. So he says, well, how much are they going to pay you? I said, I'd probably lose half my salary. He said, I used to think you were a smart man. <laughs> he didn't hesitate. I used to think you were a smart man. Cut me to the core. I was like, you know what? Whatever. God told me to do this. So that was the end of that conversation. I was a little mad with him because that's what sons do with fathers. They get mad at them. Amen. Come on, Doug. Help me. Amen. We do. They, 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 they say stuff. You like, you know, if you were my daddy boy, ooh. <laughs> if, you, if you were another man, man, it would be on right now. But So I was mad. And I was, sitting at our, I was sitting at our front row, 150 chairs. At that time, about 25 people in them. Amen, somebody. Y'all don't get, y'all don't get that. When you start in the ministry, you want it to blow up. 25 people, 150 chairs. So I'm sitting on the front row. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there praying, Lord, I, did I make a mistake? Did I do? Did I hear your voice? Did I hear you clearly? And all of a sudden, I felt this big old crusty hand. It felt like it scraped skin off the top of my bald head. Bam. He said, you scared? It was my dad. You scared? <laughs> I said, honestly, Daddy, I am. He said, God built you for this. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you're going to be all right. God built you for this. Was he a perfect man? No, he was not. He got a list of faults. But I'm going to tell you something. Because he was my daddy, he was my main Man, amen. He was my main man. There was no other man, watch this, whether your daddy's been good or bad, there is no other man who will influence you like the way your daddy has. I get it. Some of us don't like our daddy. Some of our daddies got issues and they tripping. I get that. Some of them have gone on and we, I get that. And we didn't finish things like we wanted to finish them. But I'm going to tell you something. There will be, never be another man who dominates your thought process. I got to preach here this morning. Dominates your thought process like your daddy does. Amen. Whether you love him or hate him, he's in your mind. Amen, somebody. And so I want to do something here. I want to release you. Whether his words were good or bad, whether his deeds were good or bad, 
I want to tell you something. What he did by living his lifestyle was to give you permission to be better than he was. Your father's heart desire for you, whether he'll tell you or not, is his prayer. Every, even, even ridiculously bad fathers want this one thing for their children. Please be better than me. Every father wants that for their children. So then, whether you had a great dad, whether you were a great dad or a poor, a poor dad, he left you with permission to be better than he was. Amen. So I want to show you this morning, I got to hustle. I want to show you four areas. I want to show you the four permissions that your father and my father, Willie Joe Boone, gave me. Watch this. I received these from my father, even though he wasn't there to raise me. He gave me four permissions that I got to hold on to because he was my main man. Let's go. I want you to write these down. Because he was my main man, my father's actions, good or bad, gave me, gave me permission. Here it is, number one. He gave me permission to eclipse his covering. He gave me permission to eclipse his covering. To eclipse his covering. Take your Bibles to Job chapter one. My father wanted me to, be, to, to, to transcend his covering, whether he, whether he gave me a great covering or whether he gave me a poor covering, his heart's desire was that I be better, that I as a father, I as a mother, be, as a child, uh, eclipse the covering that he gave me. When you get to Job, go to Job chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse number 4. Job chapter 1, verse 4. He wants you to eclipse his Covering, Job chapter 1, verse 4. If you're there, say amen. If you're on your way, say I'm on my way. Verse 4. The Bible says Job's sons, his sons, used to go and hold a feast in the house, uh, in the house of each one on his day. Possibly on his day is a reference to his birthday celebration. And they would send and invite their sisters, uh, their three sisters, to eat and drink with them. And when the days of feasting and uh, uh, days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, "Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed. Watch this, and cursed God. What does your Bible say? In their hearts. Thus Job did continually." See, Job understood his role as his family's spiritual covering. Most men know that they're supposed to cover their families. Whether they do it well or not, they do have an understanding that they're supposed to be a covering. In the old world, in the Mosaic law, uh, the father was the family's priest. In the Old Testament, your daddy was your priest. He alone, to him alone, belonged the task of blessing, purifying, and offering sacrifice for the family. It was the father's job in an Old Testament economy to bless, to purify, and to offer sacrifices on behalf of his family. So, right, so Job said something. He said, every year my children have a birthday feast. And so, he, so after that feast, he would send for his sons. He would send for his daughters, and he would purify them. Now, Job said, I'm not sure whether or not that while they were partying, they committed a sin or not. I'm not sure whether or not they were celebrating they had something against God in their hearts. So rather than risk it, I'm going to be their spiritual covering, and I'm going to ask God to bless them anyway. There are fathers among us who, who don't get this. Every time somebody says, my child did something, they'll say, no, my child didn't. And you, above all others, know how bad your children are. Somebody ought to say it, amen. Here's my policy. I'm going to back you up in front of this teacher, and I'm going to tear you up at the house. Amen. <laughs> she, not, she, don't have, she doesn't have time to call me because it's fun. Amen. I know she's a little busy. So I don't know what little bit you did, but I'm not coming. I'm not taking off of work. Come on, somebody. Amen. I'm going to get you because you made me lose an hour. Amen. Job said, I'm going to cover my children because they may have done something. 
we have in the text a father who understood the value of his covering. And whether I believe my father understood the value of his covering or not, I know at the end of his life, all he wanted was for me to ensure that my children and my family received a proper covering. That's all he wanted from me was that whatever little covering I gave, he gave me. He wanted me to make sure that I doubled that covering with my family. Somebody say amen. amen. Whatever your father wanted of you, I know he wanted you to cover your family and to cover your children. Second example. So my dad, your dad, says do this for me as your father. Cover your family better than I covered mine. Come on, somebody. Yeah, amen. Number two, because he was my main man, I believe my daddy told me something else. He said, listen, whether I'm good or bad or ugly, I need you to surpass my example. Surpass. Your daddy wants you to surpass his example. I love the saying, don't do as I say, do as I, don't do as I do. Come on, somebody. What? Do as I what? Do as I say. Really? You know the first thing I'm going to do is exactly what you did. It tickles me. I had relatives that tell me, go get, go get me a beer out the refrigerator. And then when I handed it to them, I said, now don't you drink. <laughs> well, actually, I drank some of yours when I opened it up. <laughs> some of y'all don't look at me like that. Amen. I wasn't born saved. Amen. But you're going to do exactly what you see them do. No matter what comes out of their mouth, you're going to do what? You are. Even, sub, come on, Wallace, subliminally, subconsciously. How many of you have become your mama? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you have become your daddy? I just want to see who it is. I got some folk over here will admit it. Words start coming out of your... If I were to put a picture of my daddy up on the screen today, you'd be like, which one of them is pastor and which one... I mean, somewhere along the line, we become our parents, whether we like it or not. And so, my, so your father, my father says, do this for me. Be a better example than I was. Take your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. Be a better example than I was. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. If you had a great father, you're blessed. Be better than him. If you had a horrible father, you're still blessed. Be better than him. Amen, somebody. Be a better example than your dad was. Well, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says this. You, therefore, beloved, knowing beforehand, be on guard so that you are not carried away by the error of undisciplined men and fall from your own steadfastness. You, therefore, beloved, in verse 17, 2 Peter 3, knowing this beforehand, be on guard, so that you are not carried away by the error of undisciplined men and fall from your own steadfastness. In context, the Apostle Peter here was talking to Christians who were in danger of, be, of falling under the influence, under the sway of these false teachers. They were in danger of becoming apostate. An apostate is somebody who says they believe but walk away. John says if they were if they were if they were if they were with us, they never would have left us. An apostate is somebody who walks to walk and talks to talk, but they don't believe in their heart, and it's easy for them to walk away. Peter said, "Be careful. There are a lot of false teachers out there trying to give you the impression that they're on point and guide you away from God." But there is something I think we can glean as usual from this text. First thing I think we can take with us is this. As it relates to our own fathers, we can't claim ignorance. Either you know your daddy or you heard stories about your daddy. Can I have an amen? You have some insight from somebody, whether it's accurate or not, I can't speak to that. But somebody has said something to you in your life about who, what kind of man he was. Verse 17 says this, you, the very first part, you therefore, beloved, knowing this, when beforehand, so, so then you can't claim ignorance. You already know what you're working with. I already know who Willie Joe Boone was. I know him. It was one of the hardest working men. He's an old school daddy who put his work clothes on and came home from, from work with his work clothes on. He, he was a cooker. He was a, he was a wannabe chef. So he stood there with his work clothes on, come on somebody, and cooked at the stove. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then when it's time to sit down to watch his favorite um, uh, what's the Pat Sajak and Vanna White, whatever that thing, I don't even know the name of it, amen. Uh, Price, whatever it is, I'm hooked on Family Feud, but that's another message, amen. <laughs> he would sit there with his clothes on, amen. 
And many times he would go to sleep. Come on, who am I talking to here? With those same work clothes on. So my example from him was, if you got a job, go to your job and work at your job. He didn't get a whole lot right, but I, this I got. Go to work. I already know what I'm working with with my dad. He wasn't a big talker until he got drunk. <laughs> Don't look at me. Y'all know that y'all got that. Y'all know, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Wouldn't say two words until Friday. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. It's a long weekend. And the drunker he got, the longer the weekend got. Hey, who am I, who am I talking to? <laughs> we pray that it was just a little bit of drunk. Amen. But if it was, he got real drunk, somebody going to get cussed out. It's going to be a fight at the house. Who, who am I? Y'all don't. Y'all act like y'all. P Peter said these men walk in error. These men walk in un undisciplined. And sometimes our fathers walk in error. And sometimes they're undisciplined. So what's your thing? You got two choices. You can blame your daddy for his example. But since you are already, or you can walk in an example that's bigger than his was. Yes, yes, yes. I'm a little sick and tired of my brethren and my sisters saying, well, you know, I, I, this is in my history. That's in my history. I'm sorry. It's in your what? His story. What you've been through doesn't define where you're going to. Okay, so, okay. You cannot allow somebody else's bad example to be your reason for being a bad example. Oh, Lord. Verse 18, it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. The apostle Peter said, you know what you're working with. Don't be fooled by that. Go beyond it. How do you do that? He uses a word. He says you need to grow. That's a Greek word, exano. And for something to grow, it must be acted upon by an outside power or it must have an element of life within itself. Quick example. Lilies grow and fruit grow. Their growth is not because of any special ability of their seeds, but because of the quality of life that's implanted in them by God himself. The seed may be planted. Watch this. Growth is not manifest in the seed. Come on. Your growth is manifest in the one who controls, who implanted the seed, who built the seed. Amen. So although my father was my original physical seed, come on, I know the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of my sin, so now I have a transcendent seed. Oh, that's okay. See, I can be better by example than my daddy was because of who I am now. I'm not condemned to repeat whatever he did. I'm not. I'm not destined to be him. I love him to death for his good examples, and I learn from him from his bad examples. And so what your daddy would want this of you is to watch this. First thing first, he would want you, I remember this, he would want you to um, eclipse his covering. And then secondly, what did I tell you? He wants you to do what? Surpass his what? So we're not going to beat up on daddies this, this, this time. Every year we beat up on them. I'm going to tell you something. Whatever kind of daddy you got, that's the kind of daddy you got. Amen. <laughs> that's okay. See, then that means you know what you're working with. So you have to, oh, this is good. You have to, you have to study. We talked about this before. You have to study. The, I told you, women, you need to study the men in your life so you know what you're working with. Study the little bitty ones because what's cute now is at, at six will not be cute at 16. Study the teenagers because they're around people that are influencing them now. And you still, I love teen. See, there's this, anybody remember this leash? It's one of those leashes. I've seen them with kids. I've seen them on kids, and it kind of bothered me a little bit. Amen. With the little retractable thing on the end of it. And they put it on the baby, and the baby walking around, and then the baby get too far. Baby come back like this. I don't like the physical. But, but teenagers and young adults, come on, stay with me, parents. You have them on that invisible leash. While they're living in the house with you, let them try some things. Because then you can see what you're working with. Oh, somebody don't know what I'm talking about. If you, you paint a little bitty square, you don't know what you're working with. Open that square up a little bit. So you'll know what to do. So you'll know what to pray. I learned that as a father. My example was tight. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to learn anything about these people if I don't open it up a little bit. And I was like, wow, so that's in you. Okay. 
and I hit my little invisible cord, because it got to come on and got no place else to go. Amen. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry, grown for you. ain't grown until you're gone. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hey. I, I love to do this with my son. Pull out your driver's license. What you doing? Put out your driver's license, baby. Yes, that's, that's it. What's up? Who's, whose address is on there? I'm sorry. Whose address is on your? I shouldn't have to come in at 12. Pull out the driver's license. <laughs> come on, Murray. Pull out the driver's license. I'm just a simple test. Just a simple test. Be quick. <laughs> I won't hold you long. Hey, man. Just pull out the driver's license. When that address changed, then your curfew changed. Hallelujah. Oh, hey. hey. <laughs> ah. <laughs> you get on my nerve, yep. Yeah? And you're still in my house. Hallelujah. 12 o'clock it is. Amen. 12 or 1. <laughs> Who am I talking to? Amen. I got all off track. I don't know how I do that. It's so easy. You got to surpass his example. He wasn't there to tell me how to live. I got to be there to help my children know how to live. Amen, somebody. Thirdly, this morning, what your, because my daddy was my main man, <laughs> he wants me to transcend his counseling. Now, one thing I will say about Willie Joe Boone. Me, when, when he got a little bit of Shimley's vodka, I'm, I'm just going to be all in trouble. This probably won't come out at 11 o'clock. Amen. I cleaned it up for 11 o'clock. But he loves Shimley's vodka straight. Mm, something. He wasn't playing. See, Sydney, like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> wasn't no Coca Cola, wasn't no tonic, just a little bitty sip, a little bitty clear glass. But when, he, but when he was not under the influence, we had the best conversations. And he would say to me, you know what? You're headed in a great direction. He said, but you got to deal with your anger. And I could say, you know what? You left me and mom. Yeah, I'm mad. You did this. Come on, some, who am I talking to? Yeah, I'm mad because you did this. Yes, I'm mad. You did that. Did I tell you your history? Come on, somebody. You're not condemned to walk in that. Amen. And I remember the day. Wow. Turned into a testimony. I remember the day. When I said to him, you know what? I don't like what you did, but I do love you. And he wasn't a man to cry, but I almost got him that time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like what you did. I remember we had the couch with the green couch with one of the legs broke. Mama put a sauerkraut can under there. That was your fault. I remember that. I said, if he would have been here, you wouldn't have to sit on this raggedy couch. Anybody, who am I talking to? But I, but, I, but I said, I don't like what you did, but I do love you. He said, you're going to go far, but you got to deal with your anger. You got to deal. Come on. He said, you'll get in your little mood, and you'll shut folk out. And he said, you're not going to go far that way. You got to be able to press through stuff. Man, I wish I had a, I wish I could hug him and say, thank you for teaching me that. But he wants my counseling to be better than that. Take your Bible to Proverbs chapter 6. See, a father's counseling Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. A father's counseling doesn't have, whether good or bad, it doesn't have a shelf life. What do I mean? It doesn't expire um, after you work out of your current situation. You, whatever you learn from him, it'll carry you, whether it's good or bad, you got to use it to carry you to the next level. Amen. A father's counseling is designed to help you transcend the issues you face for the rest of your life. If he was a, a alcoholic, then you, you got to fight with everything within you not to become what? If he was mean and, and, and cantankerous and emotionally abusive to your mother, then you have to do everything in your power not to, to transcend that and not let his example, I'm back on point number two, and not let his example be your life example. Amen, somebody, because you are going to become who you, who, who, who you emulate, who, 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 whoever influences you dictates the pace. So now and again, every now and again, you have to recognize this. I am not going to be the broken pieces of the folk in my life. I'm not going to be that broken. We're not. My family's not going to relive the broken pieces that will come on somebody. Amen. Counseling of my daddy. Some of it was jack. I'm like, I'm not doing that. Amen. 
But I learned something. You ready? Ready? Two things you'll learn from your father's counseling. You'll learn what to do, and you'll learn what not to do. Come on, somebody. Amen. You can't throw it away. It's valuable to you. Mm. Did I tell you Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20? My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. And when you walk about, they will guide you. And when you sleep, they'll watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is a light. And the reproof for discipline are the way of life. So you watch this. They're going to guide you. Their counseling is going to watch over you. Their counseling is going to talk to you. If you don't rise above your father's counseling, you set yourself up for the possibility of chastisement. Scurry on over to Deuteronomy chapter 21. (laughs) This verse is scary. Amen. This is a scary verse. And folks point to this and say, see how barbaric the... The Bible is, but I don't know. Sometimes it might have been, it may be the solution to what ails us. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. Watch this. The Bible says, if any man has a stubborn and a rebellious son, what kind of son was he? All right, and what else? He a little swole, amen. His driving license still say your na- got your name on it, amen, but your house address on it, but he a little swole. Who will not obey his father or his mother. Why do I say that? Why do I keep mentioning the address? Because after you move, <laughs> you're on your own. Oh, that's okay. Some of y'all don't want to. Mama's be, I'm going to call my baby daddy. Be like, I ain't calling him none. He on his own. He, he better, I hope you all right, amen. I'm going to call my baby. I'm going to drive by the house to see if fathers ain't driving by the house. Hallelujah, we ain't calling you, amen. And if you call us, we're like, what you want? What? <laughs> That's why God gave them mamas and daddies, because because with mamas, they just be 89 years old. Come on, baby. Watch the street, baby. Mama going to take you across the street. 50-year-old man. Mama, what should I wear, the blue one or the red one? Really? Uh. Who am I talking to? Somebody say amen. If 18, verse 18, if you, good gosh almighty, ain't nothing worse than a mama's boy. Ooh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Hallelujah. Let marry somebody, call their mama to see. We fight, mama. What should I do? Really? Bruh. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble first, lady. I don't mind. Amen. I got a house. Hallelujah. Amen. Huh? We got at least two pieces of bread, one for me and you. We good. Amen. <laughs> Verse 18. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother. Well, look at this. And when they, I'm sorry, not if, but when they chastise him and he will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall seize him. Come on, baby, help me hold him. Amen. <laughs> and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of his hometown, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is, what is it again? Stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey us. Watch this. He is a glutton. And what else? He's driven by his appetites. Verse 21, then all the men of the city shall do, uh, here we go, stone him to death. Mm. So you shall remove the evil from your midst. And all Israel will hear of it and do what? The rest of the boys who are stubborn and rebellious said, dog, y'all heard y'all about Rico? Yeah, man. They hit my boy in the head about 15 rocks, man. He dropped, man, quickly. Wow, wait, what do you do, man? He was talking back to his mom and them again, man. I tried to tell him. <laughs> now, some of y'all say that's cruel and barbaric, but I guarantee you it would take one week of that and all of our problems with our children. Come on, who am I talking to? 
Anybody got any volunteers who want to take the Old Testament on them? Amen. <laughs> Don't tell them to bring the church Sunday. We're just going to start rocking them. Amen. Boom, boom. Listen to your mama, fool. Listen to your daddy. If you don't listen, and that's, that's Old Testament, amen, and we're not condoning that. I'm not saying do that. That's called murder in our society, if anybody wants to check. So I want to be on a newspaper. My pastor gave me this sermon Sunday. That's why I stoned him to death. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> pastor Boo, no, that's not what I said, bro. Check the tape. But if you don't listen to the counseling, good and bad, you put yourself in a position to be heard. Can we agree there? Because the world don't care nothing about, the world doesn't care anything about you like that. Your parents are about the only somebody that love you like that. Even if they do a horrible job of it, that's as good as it. The world's going to be worse than that. And so then, so then my dad's counseling to me to guard my anger has served me well because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help me with my wife. It doesn't help me with my sons. It doesn't help me at my job. And so then whatever little counseling you got from your daddy, you need to be a better counselor than he was. I wish someone would say amen. Society no longer just wants to punish you. They've got new rocks. Somebody say new rocks. It used to be stones, but now we have illiteracy. Come on, that's okay. We have the stone called addiction. We have a rock called jail. See, now, now the stakes, you may not get stoned at the city gate. You may not, your life may not be over because of the elders, but when you disobey, disobey your parents in this way and you walk forward thinking you're somebody special and, you get, and you're governed by your appetites and you got a bad attitude towards your parents, there are other stones waiting for you uh, down the road. I got to hustle. Lastly this morning, and this is important, your dad's, because he was my main man, he gave me permission. Let's go back to, you tell me what they were. What he gave me first, he gave me permission to do what? Number one? Secondly, he gave me permission to do what? To his example. Thirdly, he gave me permission to transcend what? Write this one down. Lastly, he, he gave you permission to reverse his curse. To reverse his curse. Take your Bible to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. There's a lot we talk a lot about in the church about the generational curse and all that that entails. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 20. Hustle, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Please, sir. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Your father wants you to reverse whatever has been ailing you, ailing you, ailing your family for a little while. And I'll show you what I believe that is. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. It says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under, under the earth. You should not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a what kind of a God? A jealous. Visiting, watch this now, stay, pay attention. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who, watch, now here it is, a specific group of people he's talking about here. Not everybody, but the visitation from the third and fourth generation doesn't fall on everybody, but it falls on those who do what? Those who hate me. Watch this. He says, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven or above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them. You shall not serve them. Notice something. The Lord gave out the parameters. I don't want to be, nothing should eclipse my worship. Things on earth, things above the earth, things under the earth, things in your house, things at your job, things on your screen. Nothing should eclipse my worship. And when I don't get my worship, he says, why? Because I am a jealous God, and he says, here's what happened. I visit the iniquity of the fathers on their children, the third and fourth generations, a particular group of those who hate me. On the face of it, it sounds a little unfair to God because we punish children for the sins of their fathers. However, there is more to it than that. Let's be clear. Watch this. This is often labeled the generational curse verse. Let's unpack this verse. I want to refer to a work uh, entitled by a, a, a British theologian, John, John Owen, called Overcoming Sin and Temptation. 
He was known, Owen was known as a, the, a Scottish, I said British, Scottish theologian. He was known as the theologian of theologians. So this guy was so deep that the other theologians would refer to him. Here's what he says. The effects of sin are naturally passed down from one generation to the next. What do I mean? When your father has a sinful lifestyle, his children are likely to practice the same sinful lifestyle. Here's the important part. Implied in the warning in Exodus 20, verse 5, is the fact that the children will choose to repeat. I said choose to repeat the sins of the father. He says, for any of us who choose to walk in the sinfulness of our, pa of our parents, of our fathers, then we're going to get what our fathers got. The Jewish Targum, it's a paraphrase, literally, of the um, Aramaic version of the scriptures. It's called the Targum. It specifies that this passage is not all-inclusive. It, in fact, it refers to the ungodly fathers of rebellious children. That's who are subject to the curse listed here. Ungodly fathers who have rebellious children, who follow in the ungodliness of their fathers. It is not, un so then, it's not unjust for God to punish sin to the third and fourth generation when those generations are committing the same sin as their ancestors did. See, God hates sin. I, I want to get this to you. But for those of us who are walking in Christ, let me, I'm going to say it to you again. I have a clear substance in front of me this morning, and it's not Chimley's vodka. Oh, that's okay. Amen, somebody. You know why? Because I choose. I'm drinking water. I choose not to walk in the path. I choose not to be the man my daddy was, to be a bigger man than, oh, I wish I had a witness here, to reverse the curse. I'm not destined to be an alcoholic because he was. We choose to be who we are. Now, there was a season, I'm gonna, that's okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it, I don't care. There was a season when I was my father. There was a season when I was him. And I bumped into somebody by the name of Jesus Christ. And my whole perspective, Murray, on life began to turn around a little bit. I said, wait a minute, I'm not stuck here. Amen, somebody. I, I don't have to be here. I'm here because I choose to be here. That's okay. We don't want to admit that. We like to blame our history and our past and our physiology. Come on, it's an absolute choice. You, stand, you either go for the water or you go for the vodka. Now, amen, somebody. I'm trying to bless you this morning. And then if you go for vodka and you get a DUI, then that's a generational. Come on, I was riding in, in Indiana with my daddy to go see my brother who had just got shot. And we flying to Indiana, he was drinking the whole time. My stepmom said, no, you can't drive. I'm going to drive. I said, well, here we go. He got pulled over in Indiana. You know you're in a small town when you turn on the news and they go, uh, young kids were, <laughs> young kids knocked over a few graves in the town that's less. And, and Willie Joe Boone of, of, of Ellenwood, Georgia, was arrested for DUI. I was like, whoa, he made the news? <laughs> we in a little bitty old town. If that's what the news is. It, and I said to myself, I can't be this man. Oh, that's okay. Some of y'all don't. I'm not denigrating him. He was my main man. And we fell in love with each other toward the end. But he gave me permission not to be him. Amen, somebody. He wanted that for me. I got to go. I'm out of time. Your father, my father, would never want us to continue in a lifestyle of brokenness, in a lifestyle of misguidedness, a lifestyle of abandonment and irresponsibility, a lifestyle of addiction. He would not want that. He wants you to rise above that. He would want you to do what? Reverse the curse. How do you do that? I want to show you in Exodus chapter 20. You're there. Drop down to verse 5. It says, For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children, on the third generation, the fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6. But... Come on, somebody. You see, the Lord said, this is how it stops. This is how you reverse the curse. I'll, but showing loving kindness to how many? To those who do what? And do what else? Come on, curse broken. Amen, somebody. You don't have to be who. Once you give your life to Christ, once you love the Lord all you got, once you work hard to walk in him, curse broken. Amen, somebody. My sons don't have to face that. They got other things that they got to look at me and, and avoid, amen, but that ain't one of them. You can, and you are supposed to be better. Your father wants you to be better, stronger. Fat, I'm, starting like a, I'm starting to act like I'm doing the $6 million man here, faster, stronger, better. Anyways, 
Some of y'all are like, who is this six million dollar man? <laughs> Whenever Israel turned from the idols to serve a living God, the curse was broken. God saved them. Judges 3, 9, 1 Samuel, I don't have time, 12, 1, 11, 10, 11 say this. When a Christian who is worried about generational curses, watch this, the answer is salvation through Jesus Christ. Whenever your family begins to walk in the newness of Christ, all of that past is is simply that, the past. Amen. I don't claim any of the brokenness that was, watch this, that was part of my generation behind me. I don't claim any of it. As a matter of fact, my marriage has lasted 30 times longer than one, the, the one closest to me. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, we have degrees in my family where folk didn't even get out of high school. That's okay. I'm going to tell it. As a matter of fact, we own three cars in a house. I wish I had a witness here. But where we used to live in the projects and ride the bus, I don't have to be who they say I am. You don't have to be what your past says you are. You have to stand up and quit tripping. Amen. That's okay. I don't mind this morning. Stop living the life blaming somebody else. You are where you are because of the choices you made. And you don't have to stay stuck nowhere you don't want to stay stuck. Amen. I'm done. But I've said too much. Whether your father has done a great job or whether he had done a horrible job or whether he didn't do any job, amen, he's going to always be your main man because what he left with you was a legacy that you can build upon. Either you can, you can be better than him whether he was a good father and you can certainly be better than him if he was a bad father. How do you do that? He wants you to eclipse his covering. He wants you to surpass his example. He wants you to transcend his counseling. And he wants more than anything to, to, that you and your family accept Christ as Lord and Savior and reverse the curse. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ. We thank you so very much for this opportunity. A charge almost on Father's Day, Lord. Not just to the dads, but to the children of fathers. Not to be stuck in a place, but to rejoice in all that our fathers taught us good and bad because we can learn so very much as how to transcend them in every way. And for those who are my dad's, my dad's been gone a little while now. And I pray that there was a season in his life where he accepted the Lord as his savior. But I know this, he would want that his grandchildren, he would want that his children and his grandchildren and his great grandchildren will become better than he ever was. And I know this for a fact, no matter where he is, whether in heaven or whether in the place below, he would want all of us to, he would want all of his family to know you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You need to walk in the newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in a Christ, all things are made new. The old man becomes a new man. So I praise you today for my father. Lord, I thank you for one Willie Joe Boone because he was my main man and he showed me so much of what to do. He also showed me what I shouldn't do. And I thank you for him. And we're not, we're going to be released here today. If some of us are having a bad, are having, a, 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 some of us are not there and, and have all these issues, we're, we're going to move past that because our fathers were just that, our fathers. But whatever they taught us, we ought to grow beyond that. Amen, somebody. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And for his sake we say, amen. Give the Lord some praise in his house today. Yeah. If you're here this morning and you haven't accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, the relationship, not a religion, the relationship with Christ is what you need. Jesus loves you as is. Jesus loves you as is. He knows where you're broken. He knows where you're chipped. He knows where you're growing. And he says, listen, I am here for you. But here's the catch. You have to want Christ. Christ is not going to force himself on you. 
You have to want him. You have to want to accept him as Lord. You have to want to accept him as Savior. And then you can begin the process of walking in the newness of life. And he'll deal with your past. Oh, my, he already dealt with it. The blood shed on Calvary's cross already dealt with your past. But it's not your, it's not dealt with until you accept him. Anyone here this morning? And you haven't accepted Christ. And you know in your heart of hearts that this, this is the day that I need to, to walk in the newness of life. Yes, on a Father's Day. Yes, as father, as a pastor, challenge me about the, the need to be better than my father, whether he was a good man or not, to be better than him in so many different ways. We're beyond that now. This is about a relationship with Christ. Is anyone here today? You know you need the Lord. Your past tells you you need the Lord. Your present tells you you need the Lord. Are you here? Won't you stand? Just one. We are prepared to receive you today. Christ is prepared to accept you into the kingdom today. Is there one?